uh, welcome back to our uh, monthly webinar. Today we um, have a very interesting paper called um, Serial Entrepreneurship in, uh, in China. The presenter is Lauren Brandt from uh, University of Toronto. Lauren, you have 25 minutes to present. The floor is yours. So first of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, you know, this is a paper with Raj and Dai, uh, Yorgi Kambaroff, Shadow Store Sledin, and Xiaobo Zhang. And, uh, I believe that both uh, Ra Chen and Shettle are also again participating. They're here this evening, so which is great because if as questions come come up, you know later on, they may be very helpful. Uh, let me just kind of begin with a little bit of a kind of motivation. Uh, you know, it doesn't really matter whether we're talking about uh, developed countries or emerging countries. I think there's a general sense that you know entrepreneurship, you know, is extremely important, uh, and that when we talk about entrepreneurship here, I'm just talking about. Uh, you know, the ability of individuals to start and successfully run, you know, and manage firms. Uh, and so that insofar as that entrepreneurship is important, it just kind of raises these kind of fundamental questions about what drives it. Uh, and at the same time, what kind of either frictions or factors, again, may be impeding, you know, the development, you know, of entrepreneurship. Uh, if we talk about entrepreneurship, we can also talk about serial entrepreneurship. And so here, serial entrepreneurship, serial entrepreneurship just refers to these individuals who happen to start, you know, more than one firm. Uh, you know, that in general, that as you kind of look out there, that we know much less, again, about serial entrepreneurship, although there, we're beginning to see, again, kind of uh, an increase, again, in, in, in the literature. Uh, but there's a kind of a lack of, of kind of, in, of empirical stylized facts on serial entrepreneurship. And there's kind of limited theoretical literature, you know, on serial uh, entre entrepreneurship out there. Uh, in the context of China, I think there's several things, again, that, that we know and that kind of help to kind of situate uh, kind of our interest in serial entrepreneurship. You know, on the one hand, that when you take a look uh, at, for example, at productivity growth, uh, one of the things that we know that new firms, firm entry, uh, ends up be, uh, accounting for a significant portion, again, of that growth that we happen to observe. Uh, one of the things that we also know is that over time, that, uh, that the percentage of firms that are being started, again, by these entrepreneurs that we happen to call serial, uh, has gone ahead and increased, you know, as well. So they're going to be extremely, again, important, again, to this growth that we observe. And so that more generally, that by looking again at entrepreneurship kind of through the lens of serial entrepreneurship is that we learn something again about the nature of the frictions uh, that might be facing entrepreneurs uh, who are interested again in starting new firms. Uh, and we may also learn something then about the drivers of, of entrepreneurship. So in this paper, what we're going to do is that we're going to draw on a, a unique set to try to document certain facts, again, about serial entrepreneurship. Uh, we're going to want to document how these serial entrepreneurs happen to differ from their non-serial counterparts. Uh, we're going to want to take a look at the differences, again, between the first and second firms that these uh, serial entrepreneurs happen to be operating. Uh, we're also going to be interested in this decision on the part of serial entrepreneurs to run their firms concurrently. By that, I just mean kind of at the same time or perhaps that they run them sequentially. And we're also gonna be interested in the decisions, again, uh, with respect to the second firm that these serial entrepreneurs happen to be operating about where they decide to uh, operate these firms, you know, as well as the sector that they're going to be operating as, as well. And so to try to kind of rationalize what, we're, what, we see, uh, what we see empirically, we're gonna develop a simple model. And what that model is going to do is to emphasize and highlight a number of things, you know, in particular, kind of the role of the endowment, again, that these entrepreneurs happen to be coming to the table with, you know, their kind of latent ability, as well as the distortions, again, that they may be facing out there uh, when they uh, operate. So in terms of the kind of the basic question about why, you know, we might, some entrepreneurials might be serial, you know, why is it the case that some of these entrepreneurs are operating two, three, or four firms? There's basically kind of two views that are out there. You know, one possibility is that these serial entrepreneurs are just simply better, you know, that there is something, again, about them, that there's some kind of latent kind of potential or ability uh, that makes them better, uh, and that, moreover, that this is just kind of persistent, again, across the firms that they happen to be operating. And so in that context, then, that we would expect it to be optimal, you know, for these very highly productive entrepreneurs, again, to become serial and to be operating uh, more than one firm. The alternative interpretation is that, well, it may not be so much ability, uh, some kind of underlying latent ability on the part of these entrepreneurs, but rather it may be related to certain kinds of distortions that are out there. You know, that in order to be able to start a firm, you need a license, that there may be certain kinds of inputs that may be critical, uh, you need market access. Well, it may simply be that some individual, you know, entrepreneurs have certain kinds of advantages in terms of being able to get the license, getting access to these inputs, being able to obtain market access. 
And so in this context, then it's not so much, you know, how good you are, but maybe who you know. And so we might expect then favored, favored individuals, you know, kind of end up starting again, uh, many firms. So in terms of data sources, I'm not going to have a lot of time to talk about this, but the key data source that we're going to be Leveraging is the business registry of China. Uh, it's maintained by the State Administration of Industry uh, and Commerce. And that it basically, it's a universe of all firms that ever established. Uh, we're going to be drawing you know, on a, on a cross-section, or it's kind of like a cross-section from 2015, that provides us information on all firms that will have ever been established, again, up to 2015. You can see in the slides some of the, the information, again, that we happen to... Uh, that, is included in the business registry. And what's important from our perspective is that we know who the investors are, who the individuals and enterprise investors are going to be in any uh, enterprise. And that's going to be extremely important, again, to be able to identify, again, kind of who started uh, the firm. And so that these investors in these firms are going to be identified through a unique ID, again, in the business registry, and that we're also going to be able to know then the year in which these investments were made. Information that we have in the business registry is going to be complemented by the firm inspection data. And this is information that's self-reported, again, on the part of these firms uh, that provides information on sales, assets, liabilities, and profits of each firm. Uh, you know, over time, uh, the coverage of the inspection data has gone ahead and increased. Uh, it covers a majority, again, of firms in a majority of provinces after 2000, uh, from 2008. And so we're going to be leveraging, again, the firm inspection data for a window of about five years, uh, for which, again, we believe that the data, again, uh, is of relatively high quality. So that in terms of our definitions, uh, what is an entrepreneur? Well, an, in, an entrepreneur is just going to be an individual investor that happens to have the largest share, again, of the firm at the time that the firm was established or acquired later. It turns out that in a majority of the cases, maybe 80, 90 percent, that the individual, again, who started, that we observe, again, in the data that the individual in, uh, investor uh, that we identify is the entrepreneur is, in fact, again, the individual, again, who made uh, his investments or her investments at the time uh, that the firm was established. A serial entrepreneur, on the other hand, is just simply going to be an, an individual who has gone ahead and started more than one firm. And that our definition is going to be backward looking. And it's backward looking in the sense that let's just say that the last year of data that we happen to have is for 2015. And so we know all the firms, again, in China that will have ever been established up through 2015. We can look back from the perspective of 2015 and identify all of those entrepreneurs who will have had by 2015 will have established, again, two firms or more. And so from our perspective, those individuals are going to be serial entrepreneurs and that we'll be able to identify for those entrepreneurs, the first firm they started, the second and third, fourth, you know, and so on. Here's just kind of a, a bit of a snapshot kind of with respect, again, to the data uh, where uh, we can take a look uh, at, at shareholder information. And so one of the things that we can see is that between 1995 and 2015, just huge increase in terms of the number of firms that happen to be out there. Uh, that we can divide these firms into those and where the largest shareholder happened to be an individual. And so those, again, that are kind of identified right here, some of these firms where the largest shareholder happens to be an individual, some of these where there just happens to be a single investor, in some of these there's going to be multiple investors, that in addition, again, to these firms where the largest shareholder happens to be an individual, there are also going to be some, again, where the investor happens to be you know, an enterprise. And so in this paper that we're going to be focusing on, on these firms where the largest shareholder happens to be an individual, it could be, again, a single individual or it could be uh, multiple uh, in this case. right? And so here then we're going to be looking at firms where an individual happens to be the largest shareholder. Here you can kind of get a sense in terms of what's happened to the role of serial entrepreneurs uh, over time. Uh, we can see, for example, the total number of firms, again, that have been started by uh, individual investors. We can see the percent that had been uh, that, in fact, had been started and ran by serial entrepreneurs. We can take a look at total registered capital, the percent of registered capital uh, that has, uh, you know, under the serial entrepreneurs, and that, you know, in general, that what we see is that the percentage of firms that are being ran by serial entrepreneurs remains relatively constant, perhaps kind of a slight increase over time. Uh, it's also the case that the percentage of registered capital, you know, in this case, again, under firms that are being ran by serial entrepreneurs, you know, it basically increases up to 2010. Again, it's a little bit lower into 2015, but some of that, again, just may reflect the fact that uh, that in 2015, we have, you know, some entrepreneurs with some later point 
uh, may have gone ahead and started uh, uh, second or third firms and thus themselves would have become serial, but it's just simply not reflected. The other thing that we can also see that in terms of registered capitals that in general, that firms that are started by serial entrepreneurs are about twice the size, again, of those that are being ran by non-serial. One other kind of important kind of fact uh, with respect to these serial entrepreneurs is that in a majority of the cases that the firm that is in fact being established or that, uh, uh, that the 83% the of the serial entrepreneurs that when they establish their second firm, you know, that in fact that the firm is going to be ran concurrently with the first firm. In other words, that they're going to be running both of these firms uh, at the same time. Well, to try to kind of make some sense, again, in terms of what we're observing, uh, I just want to kind of sketch out a relatively simple model. This is going to be a two-period static model. There's going to be a fixed set of, you know, entrepreneurs out there. And that entrepreneurs, again, in principle, can go ahead and can start, you know, uh, a firm, you know, each period. Uh, you know, their TFP is going to be stochastic uh, in this case. But what's going to be critical here is that we're going to allow for the possibility uh, that the productivity of these firms that are started by these entrepreneurs are correlated and that correlated again through row. So kind of at the outset, I talked about this possibility that, you know, perhaps productivity, you know, in these firms that are being started by these uh, entrepreneurs, that there's some persistence to it. Well, row here is just going to be kind of capturing the extent of the persistence, again, in the productivity, again, of these entrepreneurs. Here again, we're going to assume otherwise that entrepreneurs are, are risk neutral and that they're just going to consume, again, everything at the end of, of second period. Uh, that in terms of the kind of production and markets that we're going to assume that there's a decreasing returns to scale again technology, uh, that firms are going to be able to hire labor uh, at a wage rate W, uh, they're going to be able to borrow from banks at an interest rate uh, R. But what's important here is that there's going to be a friction that the firms are going to face in, in the form of a collateral constraint. And so that firms are going to be you know, limited in terms of the amount that they're going to be able to go ahead and to borrow, that they're going to be limited again by the amount of equity that they have. And Lambda here is just going to go ahead and gonna, gonna capture here the, the, this kind of collateral con constraint that they have as firms, again, are only gonna be allowed to go ahead and to borrow up to some multiple, again, of what their own equity happens to be. And clearly that as Lambda goes ahead and increases, then in some sense, that collateral constraint, that friction uh, becomes again, a little bit less binding. Uh, there's two decisions that we're gonna kind of focus on here from the perspective uh, of these entrepreneurs. One, again, is just gonna have, is gonna, is going to relate again to the capital and the debt decisions again of the firm, related again to how big the firm is going to be. Uh, the other is going to be the decision on the part of the entrepreneur to even decide to kind of operate the firm. So there are going to be two kind of possibilities so that we can divide, you know, entrepreneurs here into two basic types. Those who are going to be constrained again in terms of their choices, those who are going to be unconstrained, and that we go ahead here and we can kind of work through what the capital uh, kind of the optimal and the debt decisions, again, are going to be for these two kinds of entrepreneurs. And so kind of in this first row here, this is going to be the optimal capital decision for an entrepreneur who happens to be constrained. Same thing again with respect to their borrowing. But what's important here is that what we can go ahead and that we can demonstrate is that the optimal, optimal amount of capital and the debt are going to be weakly increasing both in Z, both in terms of their productivity and in terms of their equity. So that in general, that these entrepreneurs, again, who happen to be better in the sense of having higher productivity, again, that their optimal capital, again, a use is going to be higher, that the amount that they're going to borrow is also going to be higher you know, as well. There's a number of testable implications that kind of come out of this setup that having to, to do, again, um, with about the relationship between capital and TFP. I don't have, again, time to kind of go through these testable implications, but one of the things that we're able to demonstrate in the paper, and I believe it's figures six and seven, again, that all of these things, again, certainly are, are confirmed, again, in the data that we happen to, to have. Uh, the other decision that the entrepreneur has to make is the decision whether or not they want to even go ahead and that they want to enter, they want to start, you know, a firm. And so here that the entrepreneur is going to kind of come in with a certain amount of equity, that they're going to observe, again, their TFP. All right, kind of the TFP for a potential firm. And then they're going to have to go ahead and decide whether or not that they want to, en to enter, is that we can go ahead and that we can define that there's going to be some kind of optimal threshold uh, for the, this entrepreneur here in terms of productivity, so in terms of Z, Z star, and so that those entrepreneurs who happen to have a, a level of productivity that happens to be higher than this threshold, they're going to go and they're going to find that it's profitable to go ahead and to enter. What's also key here, again, is that this threshold uh, is in fact going to be, you know, weekly falling in their equity. In other words, that the level of TFP for which it's going to be profitable for an entrepreneur to go ahead and to enter 
is in fact going to be lower, again, the more equity that the entrepreneur happens to be coming to the table with. Uh, this diagram here just kind of illustrates, again, the entry choice, again, on the part of the entrepreneur that depends both on their TFP as well as on their equity. You can see, again, that there's going to be this certain range, again, of values, low TFP, low equity, for which it's not going to be profitable for the entrepreneur to go ahead and to enter. This red line is the locus, again, of points for which they're just going to be indifferent. You know, on the other hand, for those entrepreneurs for whom it's profitable to enter, but, you know, limited perhaps in terms of their equity or in terms of their TFP, they're going to be constrained again in terms of their choices. You know, on the other hand, those entrepreneurs for whom it's profitable to enter, you know, in this case, who come to the table with lots of equity, but also high TFP, they're going to be unconstrained. Uh, entre uh, they're going to be unconstrained. The second then is that the, in terms of these serial entrepreneurs, is that then again, they have to make a decision with respect to uh, the second period. And so in that second period, the entrepreneur is going to have an, op an option to go ahead and to start a new firm. And that where we're going to assume, again, as we said before, that the productivity, again, uh, in that second firm is going to be correlated, again, with the uh, productivity draw, again, in, in the first firm. And so that an entrepreneur who's already going ahead and operating a first firm, that there's one of two things that they can do, or one of several things that they, go, that they can do. You know, they can go and they can start a new firm. They can operate the new and the old firm concurrently. Uh, and so in this case, then, that they would be a serial entrepreneur who would be operating both firms concurrently. On the other hand, they could start the new firm, but also close, again, the old firm. They're still a serial entrepreneur, but they're only, again, running that second firm. You know, on the other hand, they could decide not to start the second firm and just keep operating the old firm, in which case that they would be non-serial entrepreneur. Um, so if uh, so here, again, that we're also going to assume just an assumption that we're going to be making is that, you know, the entrepreneur is going to be able to kind of cost kind of reallocate capital and labor again across these terms across these firms uh, in order to be able to equalize the returns again on the uh, on the margin so then what is it then that's going to what can we say then about these firms then that these serial entrepreneurs then are going to go ahead and to operate well there's two kinds of perspectives that we can take so if we kind of go back to what we said at the outset this kind of notion again that perhaps these serial entrepreneurs are better uh, that productivity happens to be persistent well, here that there's two cases that we want to take a look at. First case where we're going to assume that there's no financial frictions. Well, if there happens to be no financial frictions, then it turns out in that particular case that as long as we allow for some persistence, again, in this productivity across these firms that are being operated by the serial entrepreneur, then it's going to be the case that the productivity of that first serial entrepreneur is going to be larger than that of non-serial firms. And the mechanism here, mechanism mechanism here is that just that these serial entrepreneurs are being positively, again, selected on their TFP. It's also the case that if Rho here, again, is sufficiently large, then not only is it going to be the case that the first firms started by these serial entrepreneurs will have higher TFP, but it's also going to be the case that the second firm that started by the serial entrepreneur is also going to be lower, again, is also going to be higher uh, as well. Well, if we live in a world in which there happen to be some kind of financial frictions or constraints, and in fact, that's kind of the world that we expect here, uh, then, you know, in this particular case, then that the initial equity as well as the retained earnings of that entrepreneur, you know, are going to go ahead and affect, you know, selection. And so here it turns out that in order to be able to, be able to say something again about these serial, about the firms that are ran by these serial entrepreneurs relative to their non-serial counterparts, we have to, again, say something or make some kind of assumption, again, about, about, the, about the relationship, again, between equity and TFP. And so here, the assumption that we're going to be making is that the kind of the equity that that entrepreneur happens to be coming to the table with, you know, is monotone increasing in the initial TFP draw. You know, this is, in fact, a, uh, an assumption that we're you know, able to verify, again, in the paper. And I believe that it's uh, in figure five, again, that we kind of show the relationship here, again, between kind of initial equity, again, and the, and the TFP draw. So if we live then in a world with financial frictions that, you know, if we assume then that that assumption too holds, and as long as it's the case that there's a sufficient degree of persistence in the productivity, then in that case, then the serial, the firms that are being started by these serial entrepreneurs are going to be positively selected. That proposition one is going to go ahead and to hold. And the testable implications here then is that if Rho is sufficiently high, so sufficient degree again of persistence in that, in their productivity, then it's going to be the case that with respect to that second firm that started by the serial entrepreneur, they're going to have larger TFP and capital than the first serial firm. And that with respect to the first serial firm, they're going to have larger TFP and capital than non-serial firms. 
the other kind of perspective is just this kind of distortions view. So here it doesn't have anything to do again about your productivity, but rather that you are favored again in, in some way. You know, one possibility uh, is that they're favored again in capital markets, that they're able to borrow as much as they want again at some kind of low interest rate. So here, one of the things again that we know that insofar as that they're um, that they're favored, that what that what that's going to do is to allow uh, these entrepreneurs again who happen to have lower TFP to be able to go ahead and to enter. And so that as long as it's the case that rho here, that persistence parameter is sufficiently low and some of these entrepreneurs are sufficiently favored, then the implication here is that we're gonna, we would expect to observe then lower TFP for serial firms than their non-serial firm counterparts. Well, empirically then- we're, we can, um, we're in five minutes. Yes. Yeah. Five so minutes. Yep, so empirically then, you know, we can go ahead and we can kind of take a look to see the extent to which this happens to hold. You know, and the first thing that we see is that when we take a look from the perspective of assets or with respect to relative TFP, is that we can see again that these firms that are started by these serial entrepreneurs, that they are both in terms of assets that they happen to be larger, but it's also the case that they're better. So that cer certainly that the first serial entrepreneur, uh, first firm started by the serial entrepreneur, you know, is better than the non-serial firms. But it's also the case that the second firm that started by the serial entrepreneur, it's also better than non-serial. Uh, firms, but it's also actually better than the first firm, you know, as well. There's also some predictions, again, relating to the concurrent versus non-concurrent status of these firms that uh, just in for interest of time, I'm going to pass over. Finally, kind of the other dimension that we look at the, in this paper has to do with the geographical and sectoral migration, again, of these firms. One of the things that we see is that kind of in a majority of the cases that the entrepreneurs are starting these firms, again, in the same prefecture, but in a different sector. And so here by sector here, we mean by a different uh, three digit sector. So in almost three quarters of the cases, the firms that they're starting are in the same prefecture, but only in about 60% of the case, but in 60% of the cases that they're operating a firm uh, that happens to be again in a distant sector. So the question here then is to what should the entrepreneur do? I've gone ahead, I've started a firm in a particular sector. Uh, what should I do again with respect to that second firm? Well, here again, a lot is going to go ahead and depend then on what that what the productivity again of that first firm happens to be. And so that as long as it's the case that the productivity of that first firm happens to be sufficiently large, there's going to be a number of implications. First of all, again, that we're going to expect that the TFP of that first firm should be higher, again, for uh, those firms that are started by the serial entrepreneur in the same sector relative to those that are started in different sectors. And it's also going to be the case and that we would expect that the TFP of that second firm should also be higher for the same sector firms, you know, if Rho is sufficiently large. One of the things, again, that we observe here is that we can go ahead and that we can establish that in general that it's the case, you know, that when entrepreneurs go ahead and start firms, again, in the same industry, as opposed to those that are more distant, that we can see here that the correlation in terms of their productivity, again, is higher, again, so 0.33 versus 0.24 versus 0.13. But what we can also see, again, here, that it's also the case that when we take a look at the productivity of these uh, firms that are started by these serial entrepreneurs for both the first and the second, that we can see that when they go ahead and that when they start these firms again in the same industry, that these firms are significantly better. You know, in fact, they're about 100% better compared to those firms again that are started again in a more distant industry. And they're about 20 to 25% better, both first firm and second firms of the serial entrepreneurs, you know, are about 20 to 25% better than if they had started again in a similar industry. The final point dimension that we take a look at here is just choices then in terms of the sectors that the serial entrepreneur again might uh, enter into. There's any one of a number of motivations here. It could be risk diversification that may have to do with certain kinds of linkages, complementarities again related to input output linkages. And so in general, again, that what we find here, just kind of to take a look at this empirically, is that what we find here is that these things seem to be important. You know, that on the one hand, that entrepreneurs and starting these second firms are much more likely, again, to start firms that where there's, again, more integration, either downstream or upstream, uh, that input output complementarity, again, is also going to be important. But what we also observe here that that, there, that the choice of the second firm, again, is also going to serve some kind of perhaps risk diversification kind of role, and that we're going to find, again, that they're much more likely to enter, again, into those sectors where returns, again, in those sectors happen to be neg negatively correlated, again, with, again, the returns, again, of the sector of the first firm. So here that we can see that the, these sectoral choices are serving kind of multiple 
dimensions. So just by way of conclusion, again, what we tried to do here, kind of in the context of this literature on entrepreneurship, try to say something again about serial entrepreneurship, about the factors that seem to be driving it, certainly in the Chinese case, uh, the role of, of financial frictions. The model that we lay out tries to capture kind of key elements, again, that we happen to observe in the data. In terms of our next steps, again, kind of two things. First of all, that what we want to do is to try to build a much more dynamic model, again, of serial entrepreneurship. Uh, the other thing that we want to do is just also to try to, to kind of capture this heterogeneity in the business environment that we happen to observe. One of the things that we know from some other work, again, that we've been doing is that business environments differ enormously, again, across China. Uh, this is going to have an enormous influence uh, with respect to selection into entrepreneurship and thus selection into serial entrepreneurship. And so one of the things that we might expect kind of in that context is that we might see differences in terms of these serial entrepreneurs as we look for differences across space. So uh, I'll stop here then. And thank you. Thanks, Laura. Uh, time, time is perfect. Um, uh, the discussion is Hui Chen from MIT Sloan. Hui, go, please go ahead. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank the uh, organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity to discuss this very interesting paper, it's a really rich paper here. Um, uh, I've been actually a long time a consumer of this uh, forum, so I'm glad that I got the chance to contribute a little bit. Um, yeah, so let me actually jump jump into the paper. So this is a paper about serial entrepreneurs and firm creation in China. Um, it really has an amazing uh, data on entrepreneurship uh, compared to the papers I've written in, in the entrepreneurship literature. This is really by far the most comprehensive I've seen. Uh, it has a universe of other firms in China and uh, you can track the uh, main founders through this unique identifiers. So pretty accurate tracking of uh, serial entrepreneurs in particular. Um, and Lauren didn't emphasize so much about the exactly the empirical exercise they did, but they can actually, because of the number of firms they have, they can actually control for you know regional industry and year, um, so kind of a common factors behind these firms very cleanly or <laughs> uh, more cleanly than they have been seen in other places at least. Uh, so they can actually get at the uh, mechanism much more uh, much more carefully. Um, so yeah, the paper is uh, um, starts with a model. Uh, it's actually a surprisingly simple model, I would say, but it manages to capture uh, several very intriguing empirical patterns in the data. Um, so to start with, um, they show that firms that are founded by serial entrepreneurs are more productive on average. Um, perhaps more surprisingly, the second firm uh, is even more productive than the first. Uh, and both of them being more productive than the non-serial entrepreneurial firms. Um, they also analyzed the uh, patterns in terms of concurrent versus sequential operation of the multiple firms. Uh, and they showed that both in the model and in the data, uh, these choice of sequential versus concurrent operations are linked to the gap in TFPs between the two, two firms. And then third thing, which is also quite interesting, is, is about the industry choice uh, of the subsequent firms. Um, in particular, the model pitted as a learning about industry-specific skills versus diversification. Um, perhaps that part, I think Lauren already hinted at that they would like to develop even more, but uh, at least empirically, it seems like this is uh, related to the choice of the, the uh, subsequent firms. Uh, industry choice of subsequent firms. So overall, I think the evidence points to uh, number one, the persistence of entrepreneurial skill, uh, and two, uh, shows the relevance of the financial constraints. Um, I think we already kind of know the uh, uh, you know the relevance of financial constraints, in particular in the Chinese economy context, in in many different settings, uh, including actually one of the recent papers by uh, uh, Zhuguan co-authors uh, looking at how share pledge has been a, a, a part of this uh, story for the entrepreneurship as well. Um, now, I have to admit that I'm kind of an outsider to the entrepreneurship literature, even though I have worked on some of the theoretical side of this. Uh, but I think actually being an outsider gives me a perhaps a, a more um, fresh perspective because it asks me to think harder about why I should care about this topic, in particular, what I should care about serial entrepreneurs. So I'm going to spend my first comment talking about exactly that. And then from there, I'm going to talk about um, why uh, is serial entrepreneurs' performance persistent? 
Um, I think the authors show pretty convincing evidence of the persistence here, but in terms of interpretation, I think it's quite important to try to dig deeper into this. And this is gonna be the core part of my comments today is gonna to be about. And then at the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a uh, measurement issue of TFP, which I think potentially the authors may want to look into as well. So let me start with um, the kind of the, the question in entrepreneurship, which is, you know, when a new entrepreneur or when a new project shows up, uh, you know, how do you know if this is a good project? How do you know this is a good founder? that uh, you should trust your capital with, right? Obviously, uh, in the context of Chinese government that is trying to foster uh, entrepreneurship, uh, this question of uh, how to identify skill, how to identify you know, persistent skill is gonna be hugely important. Um, so that brings me to the first question here. Uh, why should you care about serial entrepreneurs? Um, the, the first reason is pretty obvious. It's because it's big, right? So in, in this paper, uh, Lauren co-authors show that uh, in China, large and rising share of Chinese firms are created by individuals. So in 1995, this number was 31%. In uh, 2015, this number has risen to 87%. Just shows if you want to understand firm creation, understand individual driven firm creation was by far the most important. And then among the firms that are founded by individuals, uh, a pretty sizable fraction are uh, by uh, serial entrepreneurs. So that number flows around 30%. Um, I can find uh, a, uh, another paper in the US uh, in terms of the you know, similar num numbers. Uh, so this is by Gompers et al, uh, uh, Journal of Financial Economics 2010, which found that uh, for VC backed firms, so these are probably larger firms I'm guessing, uh, the number is about 10 percent, at least in 2010. Uh, in 2000, um, you know, you, some some of you in the audience might know about more recent evidence on this, uh, but it seems like this phenomenon is perhaps uh, quite a bit more significant in the Chinese context. Um, the second reason why we should care about serial entrepreneurs is that, uh, um, from the perspective of understanding performance persistence, they are hugely helpful, right? Because you can literally track the same entrepreneur uh, across diff different firms and really get at this persistence and performance at the entrepreneur level. Um, many of our uh, studies in other contexts look at persistence in terms of, for example, uh, venture capital firms. Are they able to persistently pick good entrepreneurs? But here the focus is on the entrepreneurs themselves. Can they actually generate persistent performance? Again, um, uh, in that paper I mentioned earlier by Gompers et al., they showed that there is indeed persistence in performance in the U.S. context. Um, they find that, uh, a, uh, again, a VC-backed serial entrepreneur who succeeds in a venture um, has a 30% chance of succeeding uh, in the next venture compared to 21% for first-timers uh, and 22% for uh, serial entrepreneurs who had previously failed. And in this case, they define success, success as you know, firms going public. Uh, of course, the, the measure is quite a bit different here. Here we're focusing on the TFP as opposed to uh, eventual success, and we're dealing with uh, potentially quite a bit smaller firms. Um, a third reason, right? So going deeper and deeper, the third reason we want to think about uh, we should care about serial entrepreneur is uh, going beyond persistent performance and actually trying to disentangle the different sources of performance. I think this is where there's a potential, actually tremendous potential for this paper to make a, a really meaningful contribution um, because of how rich the data are here, uh, is to basically try to help us understand better uh, whether this kind of persistence in performance comes from persistence in scale, uh, could it be due to learning, or uh, financial constraints, um, or maybe the interactions among these different forces. Uh, why is this kind of a disentangled in the different sources so important? Well, because uh, part of the reason people are so fascinated about the performance persistence was, um, you know, it has hugely important uh, policy and practical uh, implications, right? So let me just kind of phrase one example of this. Uh, should government foster learning, right? If learning is indeed the, the driver behind uh, uh, the performance persistence. Uh, and if that's the case, maybe we should uh, uh, design programs that will give out many small grants so that people can actually have 
their uh, entrepreneurial experience and learn from them, right? So this actually was you know, picked up by uh, some, of, some of the work by, for example, uh, um, uh, how uh, uh, AER 2017. Um, or alternatively, if it is not about learning, but rather uh, about innate skills, right? This is something that uh, this paper has talked about. Um, then maybe the solution could be quite different, right? Maybe it is really going by the track records. Those uh, um, serial entrepreneurs that had good performance in the past or just better. And if that's the case, maybe we should try to find ways to identify them and provide more resources to them. So I think this is quite important and I would really like to see if it's possible to use the rich setting here to understand more. Um, so going to this part about why uh, SE performances are, are, are persistent here in the model, I think it has to do primarily with the selection. Right? This is what Lauren explained earlier. Um, so effectively it's the combination of the selection by the entrepreneurs on the first and the second project, in particular the threshold they draw for the TFP in order for them to get into a, a new firm. Uh, and in combination with the persistent skill, which is the basically the autocorrelation in the productivity um, that, that leads to these uh, type of uh, persistence in performance. Um, so in particular, actually, it, it, it's very stark that in a model, if you set this autocorrelation to zero, uh, then you would get the, the uh, non-serial entrepreneur firms and the serial entrepreneur firms to have essentially the same expected TFP. So the, the main effect about persistent performance will be gone. Um, um, and by the way, actually, so this is complete a side note here uh, in terms of the discussion. I, I was actually reading about the uh, the paper's discussion that pits skill uh, against uh, the potential connections that entrepreneur can have. I think here my reading is that uh, you know the, if if the entrepreneur was uh, uh, um, productive because he has the better connections, I would have thought that the connections themselves could actually be persistent as well. So it, it seems to me it's hard to disentangle that from uh, innate skills. Um, but that, of course, potentially matters in terms of interpretation, uh, because if you want to emphasize efficiency as opposed to you know, some other forces, then this distinction, distinction maybe is indeed important. Uh, but going back to the, the, the paper here, um, again, if you think about the role that financial constraint plays, it really just is limited in, in the sense of that it affects the TFP threshold for future firms, but doesn't directly affect the persistence, the performance itself in, inside this model. Um, but you could think about alternative channels where the persistent performance can actually arise in the absence of autocorrelation in skill. So entirely shutting down the skill persistent and still get performance persistence. And, and this is, has to do with this notion of uh, basically success breeding more success, right? So. In this literature, people talk about perceived performance persistence can actually lead to real performance persistence if, you know, when people observe past successes, um, you know, then they are these kind of serial entrepreneurs can have an easier time attract capital because creditors are, are more easily trusting in them. Uh, or maybe they're having an easier time hiring labor because uh, employees, in particular talented employees, are more willing to join these firms that are founded by credible uh, entrepreneurs uh, uh, or perceived uh, credibility in this case, uh, as well as suppliers and customers who are also more willing to sign contracts with these type of uh, entrepreneurial firms. Um, so effectively, this kind of past track record became a coordinating uh, coordination device uh, which could potentially lead to multiple equilibrium in this case. Um, I think this is actually especially true when financial constraints are severe, and I think that is the case we're, we're, we're talking about in the Chinese economy context, uh, because past successes could actually help relax financial constraints. In, in using the, the language of the model, it could actually help relax this uh, collateral constraint or increase um, the entrepreneur's uh, uh, inside capital in future periods, or maybe both, uh, which could poten potentially raise the profitability and reduce failures, uh, even after you control for uh, productivity. Uh, so seen in the model where both uh, channels are operate, I think you can actually potentially uh, use the data to help disentangle these two effects and effectively uh, do a structure estimation of the row parameter. That would really get at this notion of just how important 
is this persistent skill in, in explaining the, the kind of performance persistence that we see in the Chinese context. Um, and along these lines, I have some additional kind of the thoughts about the empirical tests you could do. Uh, for example, if you're looking at the financial constraints, uh, perhaps it would help to compare the degree of persistence in performance uh, when you separate founders that are um, uh, based on some, some metrics appear to be less or more constrained, for example, based on the amount of registered capital controlling for industry. Uh, you could also compare industries that are more or less opaque because effectively the kind of information asymmetry as measured by uh, opaqueness here would potentially be correlated with the, the difficulty for getting external financing. Uh, and then another uh, dimension is basically the uh, um, how much of the uh, physical versus intangible, cap intangible capital the industry uses. Uh, we know from some other work that uh, you know the the more physical capital you have, the more pledgeable assets you effectively have to to borrow against. Uh, that would actually help with relaxing the financial constraints in this context. Um, and if this about uh, not about financial constraints, rather about learning, I think here again you can ask some interesting questions about whether uh, we are learning about management skills, um, something that's specific to being a manager versus industry uh, uh, expertise. So that would be actually not specific to owners. Uh, and is it about learning from uh, past successes or is something special about failures? Um, given how rich the data you have, I think it can actually help us understand all these questions at, at, a, at a much better, better level. Um, and I was glad that you, I heard you mention that you're as part of your next uh, step, you're going to be thinking about uh, a building a truly dynamic model. I think here, actually, indeed, quite a few uh, interesting predictions could can come up, come about from this dynamic setting. Uh, one thing I thought could actually help you is that uh, you know when firms have or entrepreneurs have this option to wait in in entry. Uh, that could actually generate this endogenous link between inside equity uh, share uh, size and the TFP that you needed to deliver one of your key results for the uh, constraint uh, uh, when, when firms are financially constrained. Um, also, you would probably get richer predictions about the capital structure uh, as well as about the industry uh, uh, or industry choice for the second firm uh, because the notion of uh, diversification, I think it's uh, kind of uh, genuinely requires some kind of a true dynamics and in particular risks inside a model. Um, okay, so my last comment is about the measurement. Um, so in the paper, the, uh, the authors measured the TFP uh, basically by looking at, uh, um, you know, from, from the model backing out what the TFP uh, uh, total factor productivity is as a function of the uh, value added and uh, capital, which is highlighted over here. Um, so I think I should, in, in a recent paper by uh, uh, Kylie and, and you in 2021, they make this point that uh, um, uh, the capital could actually be understated due to the presence of least capital. Right? So basically, if we only count in the uh, uh, capital that are owned rather than leased, it could actually understate the amount of capital firms are using for production, which would then actually inflate the TFP. Um, they found that this phenomenon was particularly relevant for smaller and financially constrained firms uh, in the US context. Um, that got me thinking that maybe uh, this could potentially be relevant for the uh, um, you know, smaller firms that uh, are you know, operating in this uh, financial constraint relevant context, which is the Chinese economy. Um, now, how would this potential measurement issue affect the results? Uh, I think it begs, begs the question whether the uh, serial entrepreneurial firms are the ones who are using more lease capital than the non-serial entrepreneurial firms, in which case it would indeed uh, lead to inflation of their TFP estimates, or maybe it's the other way around. So I think in the end, it's an empirical question. I don't know if the data would allow you to be able to disentangle these two effects or not, but it's something to potentially think about. Okay, so uh, let me conclude. I think this is an incredibly rich uh, data set and, and a very important uh, question that the authors are tackling here. As you can see, they are 
probably still in the early stage of uh, you know trying to uh, uh, you know generate the insights from the, from this data set here. So I would like to see more analysis to help us deepen our understanding of the sources of this performance persistence uh, for the uh, uh, the reasons I mentioned. You know, this could actually have pretty important uh, policy implications when the uh, government is trying to to foster more entrepreneurship. So I can stop here. Thank you. If you would like to respond to Hui's uh, discussion. No, I mean, I just, I'm going to keep it really brief. This was an excellent set of, of, of comments. Uh, I think that he went ahead and raised. I think he helped to kind of did a wonderful job in terms of trying to help to kind of situate, you know, why serial entrepreneurship is important, why it's something, again, that we should be studying. Uh, more substantive, I think, just kind of in terms of two points that he made, certainly in terms of with respect to uh, on the on the measure of productivity and the measurement of capital, you know, to be honest, I don't know how important this may or may not be in China, certainly with respect to the data that we have. Uh, they're not going to allow us or provide us a lens in terms of the extent <clears throat> to which you know, firms may be actually leasing uh, capital rather than owning it. Uh, there may be other kind of data sets that, that are out there that we may be able to, to use to take a look just to see again how important this is. But it's something that I'd never thought about, wasn't aware of, uh, but something to be mindful of. So I think that was, uh, uh, that was extremely useful. I also like the, the, the fact that he raised the possibility of some alternative channels, this notion of success breeding success, uh, that it would be extremely nice as we kind of move forward into the, into the dynamics uh, to be able to try to sort again some of these kind of competing interpretations and explanations out. Uh, so, you know, here and again, also this kind of notion of, uh, of an entrepreneur's past track record effectively serving as a coordinating mechanism, you know, that it's going to help them get better access to finance, better access to suppliers, better, act, better kind of market access, all of those kinds of things, again, that in the end may help to make these entrepreneurs, again, successful. So clearly, I think that there are these alternative interpretations that as we try to move to a more dynamic kind of structural model, uh, that it may help us to kind of sort some of these competing interpretations out. But it may also, if you kind of take a look in terms of the context of some of these choices that these entrepreneurs were making in terms of the sectors that they were going into, clearly there appear to be a variety of either constraints or frictions that they may be facing, you know, as well. So these choices are uh, that they are making, again, with respect, again, to the sector center as well as location, they're really trying to solve multiple problems. And by putting these, again, in the context of a more dynamic structural model, that it may allow us to be able to kind of estimate what some of these frictions are and how important they are you know, to these choices that these entrepreneurs are making, but also begin to able to kind of sort out you know, these kind of competing interpretations for what may be underlying the persistence in this productivity that just seems to be so important to the story uh, and the narrative that we're telling. But excellent set of remarks and, and thank you. Thanks, Ron. Uh, I'm going to use my uh, op opportunity as the chair to ask the first question. So in terms of the notion of uh, serial entrepreneurship, I wonder empirically if, if this is all mechanical because you only get to observe the, you know, the entrepreneur uh, succeed and then you observe him as a serial uh, entrepreneur. Uh, what about the failure in the data? You're probably not going to be able to see it. On the no, flip you do. side, maybe there is also a notion of a serial failure uh, in entrepreneurship. In in finance, I think the, the parallel will be in finance, we have all these hedge fund managers. They are serial managers, but they probably are serial uh, failures. So, so this is probably something in the back of my mind when I was listening. Okay. So, to cer talk. so certainly from the data that we're going to know that when a firm happens to fail, so that we're going to know that when a firm happens to have been liquidated or when a firm happens to have been shut down. And so, you know, you can certainly so what imagine. If that guy has never reached to the point of becoming a, uh, a listed firm or uh, to the extent of get to the scale that shows up uh, uh, in, in your, could that happen? Or your data is rich enough that as soon as that person has an idea, uh, you will see it in the data. So, I mean, so let me be clear in terms of what we're what we're observing in the data. So that what we're observing over this period of time is that we're observing every firm that has ever been established in which, you know, it was established by individual investors. And so that what we know, again, for this period that we're looking at this. And so we're basically looking at the period from 1995 to 2015. At any given point in time, we're going to know firms, again, that will have been established. So in 1995, 
I know every firm that will have been established up to 1995. I will know every firm that will have been operating in 1995. That when I get all the way to 2015, that what I'm going to observe is that I will have known of every firm that will have been op that will have been established before 2015. I will know every firm that was operating in 2015 as well. So I have a complete picture in that regard in terms of kind of the history of these entrepreneurs in terms of what they are doing. And certainly it's gonna, it, in principle, it's possible that I could have an entrepreneur, he starts a firm, maybe the firm isn't very successful and he shuts it down. And then at some later point in time, he goes ahead and he starts a second firm and he operates that second firm. But what's interesting about our context is that in about 83% of the cases that we're looking at of these serial entrepreneurs, they are running their firms concurrently. So they are running both of these firms at the same time. So I don't want to say that you don't, you know, observe this case is a repeat failure in that regard. Someone starts, not very successful, then gets a second case. But in a majority of the cases, they're starting these firms. When they start the second firm, third firm, they're running these firms concurrently, you know, in that regard. So okay. can I help? just can I clarify one thing? This is the last point about so I was in you know, this is the China data always has this issue. Like I got a different answers on a very important point, which is that if you find out you feel your firm is not that profitable, does do you actively deregister it? So in this case, in this case, what we are doing is that we're using information from the inspection data. And so oh, we are okay, using that's much better. That's right. And so what the inspection data is, is going to allow us to do is if, you know, in principle, if the firm is operating, if the firm is reporting this information up, right? So you are right. There is this kind of complicated case in the, in the registry data about firms, again, may just simply stop operating. They may stop reporting. All right. So for all intents and purposes, they've gone out of business, but they haven't been deregistered. And at least up until maybe 2012, 2013, 14, there was a relatively kind of strict process in terms of deregistration that got a little bit kind of looser, you know, over that time. But we're using the inspection data here because that's what's allowing us to estimate, you know, assets, productivity, you know, and all of these other things in that regard. And just for clarification, uh, Lauren uh, and, um, and your co-authors, um, in this data set, I'm thinking of like one is a pregnant state, the other one is birth state, and then the third one is gone, the listing. And what you have is all the birth, after birth, all the way. Uh, and, uh, and, but the delisting would be subject to the entrepreneur's choice. They may or may not report. Am I correct? And then at the, in the pregnant state, which is not yet registered, you don't observe them. Um, so in terms of the, in terms of the latter, that there are two ways in which you know a firm kind of may go out of business or may be deregistered is that in this particular case that the firm themselves may go through this process of deregistering it may be also be that over a period of time if they do not meet the reporting requirements you know uh, then in that case then uh, Gong Shangju is going to go ahead and deregister them themselves I right. See. And so, then I and, oh yeah yeah then I'm going back to uh, 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 Junpan's question is like we the, the concern is about how representative your sample is this is a fascinating data fascinating paper and that's why we we want to understand if there's any selection bias in the sense that uh, you suppose you you develop a company there's a yeah. planning state. And there's really you get the you get the support and you go ahead. So the planning state I would call it the pregnant state, and then support is the birth state, after birth state. So we wonder whether you get the those that are in the planning and do not get chosen. So this is in principle the this is in principle the universe of all firms that have ever been registered in China. Now right. is it possible that there are things that have not formally registered that are kind of incubating there. I, I can't, you know, rule that out. And maybe someone who knows China, you know, better than I do would be able to go ahead and to say again, that if are there <laughs> firms out there that haven't registered that are in some sense kind of incubating, doing things, starting, you know, I find that a bit harder to believe, right? 
So again, here, I think we're basically getting these firms from the point at which in some sense that they're conceptualized and in which registered cap in which there's some investment in the form of registered capital. So I think maybe that Ra Chen is maybe, you know, out there as well. Ra Chen, do you have any thoughts? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, I, I just want to add uh, uh, some, my thought. So, so there is a lot, uh, another data called the self-employed data. So because there is a large literature talking about this, like formity or informity. Mm. And uh, for our data sets, because it is like, like Lauren said, it is a universe registered firm, like incorporated firm under the government. So basically you can regard this mm -hmm. part, you, you can regard our analysis sample as the mm -hmm. formal firms. And clearly there are also a large proportion of the informity, the informal firms. And from my um, uh, from my memory, it's not so accurate, but there are, um, but there are a larger number of uh, self-employed uh, firm um, in China, I think it's around uh, 70 million uh, in uh, 70 million in around like 2015. May I add a Chinese because this context is really important. Gertie Hu, right? Yes, yeah, the that's right. Yes. Yeah. It's but I mean, the, other, yeah, yeah. But you know, other work yeah, that, that I've done. That is, data is a super, super dirty and I was trying to yeah. do something about it. But, uh, you know, I guess these guys are, are doing this registered uh, company. I, I don't know exactly like yeah. details, but but apparently like seven people above that kind of scale. Is there, I may ask um, follow up questions. What's in my mind is like the following. Let me just clarify uh, the sample selection that I worry about. Suppose I'm not talking about entrepreneurship. I'm talking about obtaining a bank loan. In your data, you will not see those people who apply. You only see those people who actually got a bank loan. Okay, that, that, that's my concern, and please help me to say, no, that's not the case. Then the, 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 the second thing is that, um, what is the requirement in China for registering? Like my experience in Canada is that I can, I can be Mr. ABC or Miss ABC, nothing happened, but I still pay $600 many, many years ago and register my consulting company. You can do that. So what's the requirement of register of becoming a good team, becoming a registered company? All this are just for clarification, please. I really like the paper and thank you. So Rajan, you probably know more than I do. <laughs> okay. A much lower bar for good to who than as a, as opposed to Chi Yes. Yeah, so um uh, thanks, thanks, Lauren. So I, I want to uh, answer the first question first. So I think uh, in our paper, we are like keen on the comparison between the IC, the first firm and second firm of the serial entrepreneur with the non-serial entrepreneur, but it's still an entrepreneur. It's, uh, it's the entrepreneur who start only one firm in a period from 1995 to 2015, like uh, 20 years. So it's really a great uh, question to compare the the, the successful entrepreneur and the unsuccessful entrepreneur that who like have the idea but they fail to get the um get the loans get the capital to start business but clearly our data cannot compare these two people uh th th these two groups like the entrepreneurs and the people who have an idea but fail to start a business so that's my uh, response for the first quest question and for the second question um Clearly, uh, self uh, data is also um, uh, data is also I I I want to answer this way. So for the formal reg reg register firms, before the business reform at two thousand fourteen, the requirements is quite high because they need to register under the state uh, ICIC and also make the pay paid in capital in the bank for like two or three months. And they commit to invest the certain paid in capital to the uh, firm business. Uh, and from the data, we can see the minimum of the registered capital of these formal companies, they decline over time. 
so 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 uh but for the informal uh, for the informal business like Gertie Hu, I don't quite know uh their incentives to register a self-employed company under the government. There must have a lot of, you know, like uh, a person sell uh sell the um like sell the beverage or the foods at the <coughs> universities, they, they may not be registered. Um, I, I need to do more um, studies on that part. But I, I think under, uh, after 2014, the self-employed data is also well, um, well, uh, well stored and clean. And we can link this Gertie Hu data with the register firm we, uh, based on the same, like the, uh, the, the same citizenship ID. Yeah. And I, I want to add a more uh, knowledge is that from our survey data, uh, there are like 20 or 30% of this self-employed entrepreneur, like a Gertie Hu Chie, and transit to become a formal business owner, like the Gong Si Fa Ren. Okay, that, that's all what I know, but I, I need to learn more about these things. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just um, have a oh, oh. Ajin? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, in fact, I have an alternate explanation for zero entrepreneurship. Uh, uh, taking the construction industry in Taiwan as example, we have a so-called Yian Jian Sha, i.e. a construction company will, will build a building and sell the majority of apartments and then liquidate itself. And then the same group of founders will come up with another construction company. Why are they doing this? Just try to get rid of the liability for apartment yeah. they sold. Right? Mm -hmm. So I wonder mm -hmm. if you can get rid of those from, from your data. But, but, but I guess it will against your finding because now your finding is a passive productivity. Yeah. And the second yeah. thought is about the uh, energy dilution. We know not everyone is Elon Musk, right? Can run in so many successful entrepreneurship. So the opposite of a learning would be like, uh, you know, when you set out your to zero entrepreneur firm, like what you said, the majority of a zero entrepreneurs actually run both firms. Do you think they will dilute your the, the energy? But of course, it's, uh, it's the opposite of, of, of your mind. So probably... Yeah. So let me kind of take those, both of those in turn. Again, I certainly I can't rule out you know the first possibility. But one of the things again remember is that in a majority of the cases, is that these firms by these of these serial entrepreneurs are being started in different sectors, and so. That again, in some sense, again, is going to be suggesting again that look at it, they're not again just kind of in your construction example again where they're setting up a company just for the purposes of building a building. Once it's done, sold off again, they kind of move on. You know, it may be the case again, and we could certainly look at this a much more carefully. Maybe those entrepreneurs who happen to be again in the construction industry again, maybe this tends to be again a little bit more common. You know, in that regard. But in general, given that in 80%, again, of the cases, again, they are operating in a different three sector uh, industry, suggests that that's you know, certainly not the case. I think that you, you raise a good point. Again, what I would perhaps word it in terms of just kind of span of control, you know, that you happen to have this you know, entrepreneur uh, has a certain amount of time and energy you know, as you go ahead and as you begin to kind of start and run more firms. That may be that may spread again a little bit more more um, more thinly again across these firms that may kind of impact their ability to be able to go ahead and to run these things successfully. You know, that's certainly again kind of been in the back of the mind, and we've certainly kind of talked about it. But it's just something that we haven't kind of incorporated kind of fully. But certainly in terms of the way in which we kind of model that, you know, certainly the technology, there's certainly some kind of de decreasing returns again to scale, certain to the ability again of these entrepreneurs. Thank you. Uh, you want to uh, go ahead. Oh. Oh, You're okay. mute. Maybe, maybe allow, I, I don't want. Uh, I, I don't want to take too much air time. I really enjoyed the presentation, the paper, and the discussions. And thank you very much. But there's one thing in my mind. I hope that um, we have an answer in the following sense. We know that there's a lot of change in China after the 215 and so on. So is there any possibility to extend, um, to extend the, the, the sample period? Uh, I'm really curious about what happened from uh, 15 to say up to 2000. Yeah, yeah. So yes, I mean, so one of the things that we're in the process of doing is 
extending again the data so that we can right. basically take ourselves all the way up to 2020 that we're interested again in how some of these dynamics may have changed again mm -hmm. over time mm -hmm. how the environment may have changed but as i kind of said kind of towards the conclusion that one of the things just on the basis of other work that i've done with shuttle and yorgi is that we know that the business environment in which these firms happen to be operating differ enormously and that you know in particular that right. in terms of the you know entry barriers that they happen to be facing kind of the financial frictions these things differ enormously they're exactly. going to have enormous effects in terms of who gets to be an entrepreneur and so in that regard that we're going to expect that there's going to be differences across space you know in terms of entrepreneurship and serial entrepreneurship and in terms of the entire dynamics of serial entrepreneurship so differences let's just say yeah. between more coastal provinces and the interior but you're right, Bernie, that there may be these changes over time that are reflective of changes in the environment as well. And these are things that we would really like to try to figure out ways yeah. to, to capture. And that's part of the motivation for extending the analysis yeah. to the yeah, I, more I, My gut feeling is that there three things happened. One is that the financial constraint may got tighter. Number two, the entry barrier would be higher. Number three, the, the expectations on property rights may have changed as well. Yeah. in the latest period. So with all this uh, this changes in the in the environment, I, I think I think I, I'm eager to see the sequel here. Yeah, no, I, Bernie, we are too because in the other work that we've done is that one of the things that we document is that between 95 and 2008 there was a significant reduction in the entry barrier over time, right. but there may have been a reversal, you know, after right. again right. 2008, you know, and in more recent years. So I think we certainly share again your interest in terms yeah. of of what's happening. Just along this line, one more question. Sorry, I'm monopolizing the, the air time, but do allow me. It, you, when you look at the serial, you have the first and the second. So you can really track down the time between the first and the second, right? For the entry. Is there yes. any change in the time? And is there like the short one and the long one? Um, I mean, the, the history gap, the time, the time gap between the first and the second, does it reveal any information about them? Yes, it does. And if I kind of, it's something that we've been looking at more carefully, but if I kind of remember carefully that at least for the period that we happen to be looking at, you know, kind of the average time between uh, the first and second firms is somewhere maybe is around three years, but it may be the case again, that that amount of time that that gap may be decreasing over time. So clearly there may be something again to learn again about insofar as that that gap, the period between which they start these firms may be declining, may itself may be revealing about the nature of the frictions, how rapidly they're able to accumulate mm -hmm. equity, how rapidly they're learning about opportunities. So yes, I think that there's all kinds of things in which one might be able to extract from that information about the yeah. process. Yeah, uh, June, allow me one more, last one. I won't take more time. <laughs> Sorry about that, Mark. but I'm just so curious. I mean, in this period, China is still pretty segmented across provinces and locations. So do you, when you di differentiate this by locations and so on, do you see variations in your result? The new so, ones in your result, yeah. So in this case, I mean, in, in terms of these results, we're just primarily looking at things again in the aggregate. Right. But so in I'm other work, for... Right. But in other work, again, that we've done, clearly there's enormous differences in terms of environments. There's differences in terms of the extent of entrepreneurship. There's differences in the degrees of serial entrepreneurship. It kind of maps out to some of these differences in the way in which we've tried to characterize business environments in terms of barriers to entry, capital market frictions, other kinds of frictions. So clearly that in environments that are in some sense good, lower barriers to entry, more entrepreneurs, a lot more serial entrepreneurs. So yes, that there are these regional differences, but so far, again, we haven't in some sense kind of mapped it out into into some of these differences that we're looking at here, because here we're just trying to say something again about the aggregate, but there is clearly there are regional stories here that aggregate up to this. Thank you. Okay, uh, Laura, I have a question on the theory part. So I wonder what role of uncertainty, um, I try to search volatility or uncertainty in the paper. So I wonder if, uh, if during a if uh, under a more volatile industry or there if there is more uncertainty, would the uh, ethereal would that industry create more ethereal uh, entrepreneur? I wonder what's the advantage of a ethereal entrepreneur? Somebody with uh, persistent skills, right. where would that person shine? Well, so 
All that I can say is I don't know, you know, if in fact industries where, uh, let's just say returns are more volatile, if you get more or less, you know, serial entrepreneurs out of that environment. But what we do know from the empirical work. But, but, but that, the, the theory part, do you have any prediction here? No. So in, the, well, well, in the theory part about who becomes a serial entrepreneur, we're just assuming that these, that these entrepreneurs are risk neutral. So it doesn't enter in explicitly in terms of the first model that's just trying to explain you know, serial entrepreneurs and differences between serial entrepreneurs and non-serial. But what and if uh, TFP uh, volatility of the TFP, you diet up or down, would that matter? But no, I mean, in here we're just, I mean, in the first mm -hmm. model, we're just assuming that these entrepreneurs, you get a draw, right? You know, you know what your pr to uh, productivity is, and then you're making your decisions. So there's no More. role again. Go ahead, Shadow. Can I answer? So, sure. So she's exactly right. But if, if imagine uh, we take an industry and then increase the volatility of, of shocks, that is going to create more and serial entrepreneurs. Okay. Because, because of the persistence is good. Mm. I see. In that the theory, if, if, if the persistence, it's, it's, it's somehow when you have a larger variance of the shocks, you get more positive selection. That's the, that's, that's the, that's the idea. Right, but Shadow, mm -hmm. in the current version of the model, we're basically assuming that ex ante all sectors are identical. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just saying. Right. It's, it's, so I was just right in the context of the Yeah. Okay. It's a very right. good suggestion, Jim. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <coughs> okay. I was I going to say that there are two questions in the in the Q and A. Oh, <laughs> I, I thought. Um, uh, um. I, I don't okay. know how to pronounce your name. Uh, Chato, Chato. Chato <laughs> is going to answer that question okay, live. Let good. me see if it's been. Um, Chato would uh, like to answer live, right? <laughs> right. It's it was a one live <laughs> <answered. laughs> uh, It's all, uh, no uh, open uh, questions left. Sorry. I think we, we are all clean here. Okay. Um, Bernie, no more last questions. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I, <laughs> the floor is on the chairs. Okay. Bunny, you were gonna tell me the next. I guess you were too, got too carried away with that with the presentation. You didn't email me the uh, send me the, oh, I, I, the I, information I, for the next. Oh yeah, I, I okay. did, I did, I did at the very beginning. Oh, you did. Um, let me see. Yeah, um, yeah. But anyway, let me just say to save time, we have to close now. I uh, let me say that I'm really very grateful. Uh, I really enjoyed this, and thanks Jun Pang for sharing this and the and the authors. Uh, wonderful discussion, very clear. And uh, Wei Chen, you are just absolutely a marvelous. Uh, discussions. We are going to drive you more and more. Uh, the next seminar is going to be on December 15th. Uh, are foreign investors informed trading experiences of foreign investors in China? And Xiao Yan is going to, to present the paper and the discussion is Dragon 10. And again, I, I'm sure that all of us agree that this has been fascinating, very stimulating onto a very important topic that we view a lot about the capital market development and entrepreneurships in China. We are, we are absolutely grateful. Thank you very much. Yeah.